Right. Okay, we are on recording mode and therefore let me once again pose the questions that I will ask. What is satire? What did Dryden have to write about satire? And what are the modes and the histories of satire? How has satire evolved across the ages? Why did satire become so important in the 18th century? And finally, how did Dryden's theory of satire have a bearing on subsequent poetry? These are the questions that we shall discuss. Now, the text that we'll discuss is a discourse concerning the original and progress of satire. This is a text by Dryden, which was appended, came before the 1692-93 version of Dryden's translation of Juvenal. Juvenal being one of the more famous Roman satirists. Remember that the major Roman satirists were, of course, Horace, Juvenal, and Varro, or many Varro and Menippius. So we have fundamentally three kinds of satire in the Roman era. One is called Horatian satire. Please remember the spelling H O R A T I A N, not C I A N. Horatian satire from Horace, H O R A C E. Juvenal, and the term comes is juvenile, nearly in satire. And finally, Varro, and therefore Varronian satire. I'll try and define what are the characteristics of each of the satires uh, sometime later on. Now, Dryden and the 18th century were all translating the major Roman satirists. Pope, of course, translated the Horatian epistles, and Dryden copiously translated Juvenal. Therefore, this introduction is part of an introduction to the Juvenalian satires. But it is here that Dryden provides a most sustained analysis of what satire is, how has Roman satire evolved, and what are the strategies that the satirist needs to highlight. Now, therefore, the question remains, and this is the picture of John Dryden, the writer of these satires. And I'll go straight to the end of your selection. I'll not begin at the beginning, as it were. Dryden provides a definition at the end, almost, of this uh, prose piece. And he says, you know, that a satire is... This is the definition. Let me put it slightly more. It is in bold, probably. But, uh, it is in bold. So take a look at where the cursor has stopped. Satire is a kind of poetry, right? Writes, invented for the purging of our minds, in which human vices, ignorance and errors, and all things besides, are severely reprehend, repre, reprehended, therefore criticized, partly dramatically, partly figuratively. So it may be directly, it may be through similes and metaphors and obliquely, and occultly, consisting in a low familiar way. So satire can be either taken in a very high invective way, or it can use a very direct, brutal, low attack, chiefly in a sharp and pungent matter, manner of speech. Pungent is odious. You know, if you have worked in the chemistry laboratory, all of you have, you will remember the, the smell of ammonia, NH3, that was especially pungent so for that you know if you've taken aqua tychotis or what we call joanne rarok that is pungent right so sharp and pungent 
manner of speech, but also partly in a facetious and civil way of jesting. So humor is one of the components of satire. So you are making fun of someone. You can make it, you can make fun of him either in a very lofty way or in a very low familiar way. But the purpose is correcting his folly or vice, right? Which by which either hatred or laughter or indignation is moved. So what is the element? What is the final aim of satire? Aim of satire is detestation of the individual, either completely reduce him to a ridiculous position or laughter, laugh at him or indignation or anger. So we have ridicule, derision and anger as the end of satire. Now, this is slightly difficult. So let me simplify what has Dryden said. Dryden has suggested that satire is a particular kind of poetry. What? The end, the purpose of satire is to criticize individual or social vice or folly. So satire is a critical genre. Its mode may be lofty or its modes or its mode may be low and familiar in common language. It might be direct or it might use metaphors and myths to criticize. And finally, it uses laughter to create either ridicule or anger or dismissal of an individual. Right. So this is the definition of satire that Dryden offers. Let me take a look at the at the definitions that are offered by other people. Right. This is Jonathan Swift, one of the principal satirists of the period, who interestingly wrote prose satires, the most famous of which all of you have read as children's literature, which is Gulliver's Travels. Swift writes, as with a moral view designed to cure the vices of mankind. So you see, the word that Dryden had used was purgative. Purgative is expelling. So you have a stomach problem, you take a purgative, and you expel all your problems with that purgative to expel, to get out of your system. So what is the point of satire? To expel, purge the vices of mankind with a moral view. So satire, the highest satire, Pope says, is not personal, but it is meant to cure a particular folly of man. His vein ironically grave. So what is the method used? Mode. The mode used is irony. What is irony? Irony is a do. Irony is a figure of speech where you have a dual meaning. You say something and something else is meant. And therefore, the irony is used to expel, expose the fool and lash the knave. Yet malice never was his aim. He lashed the vice but spared the name. Uh, no individual could resist. So what is Pope suggesting? Pope is suggesting that the best satire does not criticize individuals. It rather criticizes, uh, it rather criticizes a social folly. Right. So if the truest aim of satire is in criticizing a social folly. So individual uh, satire should not be used to criticize individually, but should be used to criticize 
a folly within society. Right. Yet malice never was his aim. He lashed the vice, but spared the name. No individual could resent where thousands equally were meant. His satire points at no defect, but what all mortals may correct. So therefore, you see, folly is a, a subject of satire. Pomposity is a subject of satire. Pride is a subject of satire. You know, therefore, Pope is trying, I'm sorry, Swift is suggesting that the best satire does not criticize individuals per se, but it criticizes it criticizes the 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 certain traits of folly within man. Now Swift in a periodical essay titled The Intelligencer also writes that there are two ends that men propose in writing such a one of them less noble than the other as regarding nothing further than private satisfaction. So can there be a satire where you attack somebody personally? Yes, there can be. That is one kind of satire. Very often, if you draw a caricature, you are creating what is called a lampoon. Right. For those of you who watch cartoons, newspaper, uh, you know, you have cartoons in newspapers. You see, in a lampoon, one vice or one physical aspect of that individual is grotesquely depicted. It is made big. So, you know, somebody might have a huge stomach. Somebody might have, you know, protruding hairs. Right. So one part or one folly of that individual, even physically, is grotesquely exaggerated. That is a lampoon, a poem which criticizes people individually. Right. That is the lowest form of satire which attacks personal. Right. This is personal satire. The other satire is what Pope says is public spirit prompting men of genius and virtue to mend the world as far as they are able. Let me give you an example. This is a very famous saying that you have. A little learning is a dangerous thing. Drink deep or not of the Paerian spring, writes Pope in one of his satires. A little learning is a dangerous thing. The Pope is here criticizing people who talk about everything but know very little. And Pope is saying that this is dangerous. Right. So he's not criticizing any individual as such, but he's criticizing a human folly in general. So even in comedy, you have type characters who are criticized as types rather than individuals. This is what is the highest aim of satire, right? So Pope, uh, I'm sorry, Swift writes, the other is public spirit prompting men of genius and virtue to mend the world as far as they're able. So satire, according to Swift, Dryden and Pope, has the quality of a medicine. You know, it's a bitter medicine that purges that makes society healthier. So the metaphor of health is repeatedly used. But if my design, he says, be to make mankind better, I am sure it is in the interest of the very courts and ministers whose follies or vices I ridicule to reward me for my great intentions, for my good intentions. So the intention of the satirist is always to improve, to restore a society which is ridden by folly to its health. Right. And then comes the greatest satirist of the period, Pope, who writes, hear this and tremble. You who escape the laws. Yes, while I live, 
no rich or noble knave, knave is a fool, shall walk the world in credit to his grave. So he says, I am a, cru a crusader against folly. The Pope is suggesting that he is a crusader against folly. Shall to virtue only and her friends a friend. So he says, I will speak in favor of virtue. Envy must own I live among the great. No pimp of pleasure, no spy of state. With eyes that pry not, tongue that never repeats. Fun fond to spread friendships, but to cover heats. To help who want, to forward who excel. This all who know me know, who love me tell. So, the... Somebody has the microphone on. Could you please mute it? Sorry. Uh, now, you need to see that the satirist, therefore, is acting almost as a doctor who administers a dose of bitter medicine so that folly is purged. Very often, there's another metaphor which is used, is the metaphor of lashing. To cane, betmara, right, to cane, so that with the lashing, by administering punishment of ridicule, you are therefore trying to purge or trying to cure the person of that folly. Now, it is very interesting to note that therefore satire has a certain framework of definition now for us. One is that the satirist is a critical poet. He will criticize. Secondly, he will not try to criticize persons, although that is possible. But if he criticizes persons and exaggerates their follies, it will be the lowest form of satire called lampoon, L-A-M-P-O-O-N. He will try and satirize public follies, personality traits, so that the people whom he criticizes are laughed at. And laughter is a kind of a medicine that will correct them, force them, to confront their follies and therefore correct themselves. Right. This is what Dryden suggests is the end of satire, to raise anger, ridicule, and laughter against folly, any kind of vice, and thereby try to correct it through poetry. Therefore, the terms purgative, lashing, medicine, etc. Now, very importantly, it is also it is also now contingent upon you to see what laughter does, because satire produces laughter. The laughter, if you see, is a very, very critical form, although we laugh and we we make fun and on so much. But laughter has a very critical theory. Laughter is originates only only when there is a departure. So if I can't try to come to class and fall down, as I said, you will laugh. But why will you laugh? Because the teacher holds a certain position. He falls down. You're not cruel, but you're laughing because something anomalous has happened. Something that should not have happened has happened. And therefore, you are laughing. So when you're laughing at somebody, you're also telling him that you are departing from the norm. And by laughing at him, you are thereby urging him to come back to the norm. You see, let me give you an example. Supposing somebody is saying, I am this, I am that, I am that. And you laugh at him and say, you are nonsense. You're telling him, don't be pompous. Be normal. So next time you laugh, you know, or you see a funny film or you see hear a funny joke. Just think about this. Why do we laugh? Is laughter a corrective? Has laughter a corrective function? These are issues which you must think about. The satirist says, yes, 
Laughter is corrective. I laugh at a person, I point out his folly so that he can correct himself. Right. Now that is all abstraction. Right. All, all abstraction. So how does one make, generate laughter and force somebody to be ridiculed and to correct himself? Let me come back to one of the quotations of Dryden. Right. Take a look at this passage. Dryden is writing about what the aim of satire is. And he says how easy it is to call rogue and villain and that wittily. It is very easy to sort of abuse people, isn't it? People say you're a fool, you're a, an idiot, you are a numbskull. You can say this very easily on the face. Right. But how hard, he says, it is to make a man appear a fool or a knave without using any of these opprobrious terms. So how does one make one individual appear to be foolish without calling him a fool? How does he subtly use language to expose the folly of an individual? To spare the grossness of the names, you are not indulging in abuse. And to do the thing yet more severely is to draw a full face and to make the nose and cheeks stand out and yet not employ any depth of shadowing. So he's using the metaphor of portraiture here. This is the mystery of that noble trade. The so Dryden is now calling satire a noble trade. And it is a mysterious craft whereby with the use of language, you will call somebody a fool without appearing him to without appearing to abuse him. Yet, which yet no master can teach to his apprentice. He may give the rules, but the scholar is never the nearer in his practice. A witty man is tickled while he is hurt in this matter. Tickle katukutudeo. Right. So you are forcing a man to laugh while criticizing him. And a fool feels it not. The occasion of an offense may possibly be given but he cannot take it. That a man is secretly wounded, yet the malicious world will fight, find it for him. And then he writes, which is very interesting, a quotation. Yet there is still a vast difference betwixt the slovenly butchering of a man and the fit finesse of a stroke that separates the head from the body and leaves it standing in its place. So he says, the satirist is not indulging in butchering a man, cutting him to pieces. It is has fine strokes through which that folly is as it of as is as it is cut off from his head. So the target of the satirist is not the man per se, he says. The target is his folly, is his mistake that he's making, or an inadequacy of his character. And then I wish I could apply it to myself. And then he says, the character of Zimri in my Absalom, this refers to Dryden's poem, Absalom and Akitophel. And there's a character called Zimri, which he says is worth the whole poem. So he says, this is the best example of my satire, where I have called a man a fool without appearing to call him a fool through laughter. Right. And then he says, but I managed my own work more happily, perhaps more dexterously. It succeeded as I wished. The jest went around. He was ridiculed. His folly was ridiculed. And he was laughed at in his turn who began the frolic. Therefore, what I'm proposing now, since Dryden has mentioned Zimri, in Absalom and Akitophel is to act 
actually take a look at what Dryden has done. How does Dryden portray Zimri, the Duke of Buckingham? Now, the word that Dryden, the folly that Dryden is suggesting is, once again, goes back to a phrase, a, a, a proverb, as, as it were, a jack of all trades, master of none. So somebody who does everything, but does not do anything properly. And somebody who is extremely lackadaisical in his attention, and who is extremely shallow, non-intelligent and shallow. In Bengali, you will call this Asthimuti. Right? So this is the vice that Dryden is trying to portray. And therefore, he invents a name for the Duke of Buckingham, calls him the biblical Zimri. And how does he criticize him? Of the true enthusiastic breed, against form and order they their power employ, nothing to build and all things to destroy. So there are a group of people who build nothing but try to destroy everything. You see, what? The, the satirist works with language. He creates laughter through language. Now, how does one create laughter? What are the figures of speech that you can create laughter with? And I do not know whether you have had any special classes on the figure of speech uh, separately. Now, I will just therefore list a few figures of speech for you. The no, first no, actually figure, not. Yeah. So let me let me give you a few figures of speech with the satirist uses. The first figure is irony. As I said, irony is a figure of speech where something is said, but very often the opposite is meant. So for example, somebody is behaving very foolishly with me. I say, I can see that your intelligence is of an extraordinary level. Right. So I'm being ironic in the sense that I'm telling him that he has extraordinarily dull intelligence. Right. This is iron. Then comes two words which the satirist very often uses, climax and anticlimax. What is climax? Climax is when gradually you are elevating a metaphor. Right. So, vini, vidi, visi. I came, I saw, I conquered. Right. So, it's like the steps of a ladder. In fact, the word climb comes from that climb. Right. So, he was great, greater, and the greatest. And then the satirist will use what is called anticlimax or bathos. B A T H O S. Right. So he will first elevate it through the climax and then let it fall. If I say he was the great, the great, the greater and the greatest fool that ever existed on earth. So I climax, pathos, anticlimax. Right. You very often use a figure of speech called zyugma, right, where two nouns are joined by a particular verb, right? So, for example, in Pope's uh, The Rape of the Lock, Belinda very often stains her honor or her new brocade. So, it is as it were, her dress and her honor are similar. So, Pope is criticizing Belinda's shallow morals. Very often, the satirist will also use a pun. A pun is a word which has two meanings, right? So these are some of the features. And of course, the satirist will obviously use illusion. So the reference to a classical or a Christian source. Say, if I say he is the very Alexander of Holland. Alexander is the great 
king. So if I say that Dryden was the great Alexander of bad poetry, then I am using an allusion of, Dry of Alexander, but only to denigrate Dryden the poet. Of course, these are examples which you will all come across in the poetry. There are metaphors which are used. For example, in Max Lechno, Dryden will create this entire metaphor of kingship, that Shadwell is now the monarch, Shadwell is being crowned, Shadwell is being hailed. But then, with the irony, will come the realization that these the emperor of folly. Right? Therefore, creating a metaphor through new, uh, creating a metaphor or successive metaphors and successive similes only to let the anticlimax create the laughter. Right? So he's creating a benchmark, a comparison of greatness, and then saying he's a fool, stupid. And therefore, it is this disparity between the metaphor generated and the reality portrayed that generates the laughter. And this laughter, please remember, is a critical laughter. The, the satirist's laughter is meant to ridicule, show the folly within the individual, and therefore bring him to his senses and correct his folly. These are the figures of speech very often that the writer of satire uses. Now, the 18th century very often used the form of the mock heroic. So it created the heroic epic mood. Right? When you write the epic, you write it in very high languages with numerous metaphors and similes. That is why it is called the epic simile. You know that when you read uh, uh, the Mahabharata or the other epics and the Iliad and the Odyssey. Now, what the epic uses is a grand style. So Dryden starts off Max Flecknow with a very grand style. And he says that when fate summons, monarchs must obey. And this was the great monarch. And then comes the anticlimax. So the heroic is used and undercut by bathos or anticlimax. And you therefore have Shadwell never deviates into sense. It's an almost epic way of telling you that Shadwell never uses his intelligence. Therefore, it is this disparity between the heroic mode and the foolish reality that generates the laughter, anger, hostility, ridicule of satire. That is the end of satire, right? So that is the effect, rather, of satire, laughter, ridicule, anger. And what is the effect of satire? The effect of satire, or the end of satire, is to correct these follies. Laughter is seen as the purgative, trying to expel these follies. This is what satire does. And therefore, let us take a look at Dryden's example of what he considers his best satirical portrait. He said, nothing to build. So against form and order, they their power employ. So this is the immortal battle. Nothing to build and all things to destroy. You see, this is the bathos. Nothing to build and all things to destroy. But far more numerous was the herd of such. Lako, he's talking about a general body of people who think too little and who talk too much. Right? So it's not against one man, but against this type of people whom all of us know in some way or the other, your friends, my friends, people all around me, maybe myself, who know too little and who talk too much. Right. So you have seen people who have opinions on everything, whose opinions never really matter much. Right. These out of mere instinct, they knew not why, adored their father's God and proper tie. And by the same blind benefit of fate, the devil and the Jebusite did hate. These are topical references, of course, to uh, the 
to the uh, allusions that he's making, born to be saved, even in their own despite, because they could not help believing right. So once again, they are so foolish that they will never believe the right. Such were the tools, but a whole hydra more remains of sprouting heads to long to score. And then comes this metaphor of Zimri, this entire portrait of Zimri. In the first rank, remember how hard it is, how easy it is to call a man a rogue and a villain. But how hard it is to obliquely call a man, wittily call a man, a fool, without appearing him to call him a fool. So he, this is the portrait. A man so various. I mean, somebody who's never really focused on one thing, who's a jack of all trades, master of none. A man so various that he seemed to be, of various abilities, not one, but all mankind's epitome. Now look at how the satirist generates laughter. Stiff in opinions. He's always very steadfast in his opinions. Almost heroic. And then comes the laughter. Always in the wrong. So he always has wrong opinions. It was everything by starts and nothing long. So he changed his opinion very frequently. It was everything by starts. He started off by being this, but was not long in holding on to his opinion. So you see how the laughter is being generated, how, how Zimri is being ridiculed. But in the course of one revolving moon, so within 15 days, he was chemist, chemist, fiddler, statesman, and buffoon. This is how the anticlimax works. Like a chemist, fiddler, statesman. So gradually elevation. And then suddenly, buffoon money, somebody who's a foolish man. So by the course of one revolving moon, this chemist, fiddler, statesman, and buffoon. So he has opinions and expertise in everything, but is actually a fool because he does not hold on to his opinions at all. Then all for women, painting, rhyming, drinking. Right. So and then he indulges his senses. Besides 10,000 freaks that died in thinking. Blessed madman. You see how, you know, almost uh, Dryden is sort of here bordering on calling him mad. Blessed madman who could every hour employ with something new to wish or to enjoy. Somebody who's always looking for new experiences. And show, and both to show his judgments and extremes, so over violent or so over civil. So this is the kind of man who is always looking for new experience, who is never steadfast in his beliefs, and who always overreacts. So that every man with him was God or devil. In squandering wealth was his peculiar art. Right. So you see how the laughter is being generated. That he's peculiarly gifted, but in what? In wasting wealth, wasting money. Nothing went unrewarded but desert. Beggared by fools whom he found too late, he had his jest. So he had the fun with these people and they had his estate. They had his money. He laughed himself from court, then sought relief by forming parties, but never could be chief. Right. So this is the portrait of the Duke of Buckingham of a type of individual who is always extremely unstable in opinions. He's unstable in retaining his money. He's unstable in retaining his position, loyalties, who knows very little but talks too much. Dryden is creating this portrait of an unstable man. Yet see how, you see, it is this climax anticlimax that is generating the laughter by pointing out to the tall claim and the actual reality and how Dryden is alluding to various biblical sources through which Zimri's character 
can be ridiculed. So the ultimate aim, mode of satire is to draw similes, climaxes, and draw out the laughter through the bathos or the anticlimax or the irony. Now, the laughter has a critical function. And this critical function is to bring out a particular aspect of folly or even to criticize a person directly. And the social function of satire is therefore to make society more even, more just, and by eliminating folly from it. So in that sense, the satirist is like a doctor who is purging society and the individual of his folly. It is this that is the chief end of satire. Right. So I have given you through certain examples what a satirist tries to do, what a working definition of satire is, and why and how the mode of satire operates. Now, the last part of this class, what I'll discuss is why does satire become so important in the 18th century? Right. Now, one of the things that the 18th century was called was a neoclassical period. So it was trying to go back and imitate the finesse, the polish of Augustan Rome, Rome during the reign of Emperor Augustus, where the arts were patronized which is considered to be the most sophisticated Roman period ever. Now, therefore, the major form of literature in that Roman period was satire, especially the satirist who was the preeminent satirist of the period was Horace, H-O-R-A-C-E, Horace. And Horace has this dictum that poetry instructs while pleasing. So the primary aim of poetry is not pleasure, but morality and instruction. Right. So the function, there's a function of poetry. You can say, what is the function of poetry? It will delight me. It will provide me pleasure. Horace says, no. The function of poetry is to instruct. And this the 18th century chose as its model. Once again, remember the history, a bitter civil war, tremendous conflicts all around. You had the conflicts between parliament and king, the Whig party and the Tory party. You had conflicts between the Catholics and the Protestants, the landed gentry and the merchants. You had conflict between the city and the country. The city was rising fast. Therefore, there were numerous tensions within society and therefore the period was ripe where a literature would be written which would try to establish their own points of view against that of others therefore satire so you have religious satires written by protestants against catholics catholics against protestants whigs against stories stories against whigs and so on and so forth also important were poets who were either writing for the king's party or for the parliament's party, writing for the Catholics or writing for the Protestants. Therefore, you have satires which are not only public, but also which are tremendously personal. Right. So it was an atmosphere where satire was thriving. Secondly, however, this is more important, is that the age genuinely saw itself as an age of enlightenment, where social political changes were happening, new philosophies were emerging, where there was belief in a greater democracy, as we have seen. And therefore, society, society was trying to reform itself. It is at this point of time that it was inevitable that a poetry would be written, which would be critical of society as it is, and try to correct its folly and envision a better, juster society, right? Therefore, you have something like in 1725, Poe publishing an essay on man, right? Which is a satire against 
human folly in general and an attempt to establish human reason through poetry. Right. For example, you have poet writing something like an essay on criticism, which is meant to establish an impartial critical stance in poetry. Right. So you have satires like Absalom and Ekitufel, which are written to question whether, I, whether any rebellion against the king is justified. Therefore, what I'm trying to suggest is that certain very important fundamental changes were happening in society. And society was moving from a feudal pre-modern period to more modern, democratic, scientific, rational basis. During this period, poetry tried to address these changes. And poetry tried to inculcate a spirit of critical rationality within itself. And therefore, it is that satire proliferated in a very large way. Now, were all these satires about man? No. There were equally satires which were very powerfully men, poet against poet. For example, we'll read Mac Fleckner, which will talk about, you know, the rivalry between John Dryden and Thomas Shadwell, two rival poets. But equally, there were satires about human beings. For example, you take Pope, you take Johnson, Dr. Johnson, Vanity of Human Wishes, or take for that matter, Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels. You've read this about the Lilliputs, right? But if you read very careful, carefully, the satire against the Lilliputs is actually a satire against contemporary English men. And this we shall read in our next uh, semester when I'll show you how the satire is not a fantastic voyage. The satire is against contemporary political, scientific follies that men were making. So this was an age which was turning its gaze critically back upon itself and trying to improve itself. And therefore, satire became a mode of literature which was dominant. Equally, there were frictions, factions, and conflicts. And satire became a mode through which these literary battles, or what we'll call poetomachia, the war of the poets, was launched. And it is in this atmosphere, I would say, that Dryden's original and progress of satire becomes so very important because it is a comprehensive thesis about what satire is, as you have seen, we've provided the definition. What is the satire's satirist's function, as you have seen, to call somebody foolish without doing so in a very fine manner? Now the question remains, who are the models and what are the practices? And these are the questions which we shall take up in our next discussion. I hope through this discussion or through this lecture, I have been able to give you an idea of how satire functions, how laughter is a very critical form, and how, you know, through the readings of certain passages, you have an understanding of what the satirist is trying to do and what and how or what are the figures of speech and how does language help in creating this satirist, uh, satiric, satiric perspective. Right. It is with that then that I will stop my recording for the, for the moment. And then we can take a few questions from you.